Hello, everyone. Welcome back again. My name is Jenna. And my name is Hannah. And we are back again today with another great music therapist. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. That would be me. <laughs> all right, then, uh, because you're all music therapists. Um, I'm Kathleen Howland, um, a longtime fan of A Place to Be, um, supporter, consultant. And um, I am a professor at at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and I specialize in the science of art and the art of science. These things, after 40 years, continue to just make me deeply passionate and curious, um, especially as more and more information is being revealed on a nearly daily basis. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic time to be in the profession. So tell us a little bit about yourself and very early stages in the profession, Kathleen. Can you tell us about how did you find out about music therapy? How did you decide to pursue this as a profession? What was it like applying to colleges? It was sheer luck that I found out. Um, So I was a music ed and applied music major. And I was in my sophomore year, I'd spent the previous two summers working with people with autism. And they were just coming out of institutions really where they were chemically and physically restrained. And it was a time to try out early behaviorism, very Skinner behaviorism, um, specialty diets like macrobiotic diets and finding ways to impact power uh, these individuals to develop and to be their best selves. And I could see the power of music in them. And I was just dazzled by it. Like one child started singing this song from like the 1920s and I happened to recognize it, put a nickel in the Nickelodeon. And I said this to his mother, I think he was like eight at the time. She's like, oh my God, that was on an instrument. You know, that was on a toy he had as an infant. And all of a sudden, this has been reconjured in his mind, unlikely that it was on the radio or anything like that because of just the age of the tune. So, you know, there was this intense relationship to music and I couldn't explain it. I couldn't be with them in it. I didn't know how to get in there with them. And then that summer going into my junior year, somebody that I knew from high school said she was a music therapy major. She was a year behind me um, and she was going to a college. I immediately switched. And in those days, I mean, you were walking the papers across, it was like late July. These things weren't done, but I knew that's exactly who I was, but I had no idea what I was getting into, right? I didn't know it would be this beautiful. I didn't know it would be this satisfying for this long. I didn't know that it would all have this biological basis that allowed all of us to understand how beautiful it is, why musicians should be paid well to do what they do. For us um, to understand that musicians really work hard, it's not talent. It's not like you were sprinkled with angel dust. It's that you had aptitude, you had opportunity and you matched it with grit. And that's what deserves to be really honored and respected. And because of these deep connections, we can help people heal. We can help them develop from brain injuries. And nearly everything is a brain injury, including autism or not an an injury per se, but a brain um, condition, you know, so everything is really being revealed. All the wonder and awe I find is being revealed. When you kind of look back on your experience first getting into um, undergraduate work and music therapy work, what did you really enjoy about your learning experience and your college experience? And what is something that if you were to do it again, you would change or would like to see grow? What I thought was great was that when I went from a music music school to a liberal arts school, I had to take all the liberal arts. And that was enormously oxygenating, it felt like. It was so great to be able to think through these issues. Like in one semester, I had philosophy taught by a priest, and I had theology taught by a nun. (laughs) So God is great. God is good. God is a mystery. And then I would go to philosophy. God is dead. You know, uh, humans create this for pie in the sky when you die. And it was just, I really love the expansiveness of, of thinking. Yes, there was the music and the music therapy was fun. I fell in love with my teacher. And to this day, we're still extremely close. Kind of moving forward to into internship, right? Like kind of a staple of, of your music therapy undergraduate work. What is your experience with going through internship and how do you feel like it really impacted you as, a, as an early clinician? 
Oh, back in the day, um, I was a part of AAMT. I have to think back. Um, and so we didn't have internships, but we had varied practica. So the, the one uh, that really, really impacted me greatly was I always thought I wanted to do psych work. I did one round at a, a very famous psych hospital here in Boston, and I went, nah. <laughs> you know, I it, it didn't speak to me. But then I, I, the one thing I did say that I never wanted to do was to work with um, people with intellectual deficits. I was not, I did not feel called to that. I ended up doing an internship there and that's just my tribe. That's just my tribe. So I love the surprise of that. I love experiencing their humanity, um, the essence of their humanity and understanding what we all share and in people who are profoundly intellectually disabled and medically complex and everything, even at that narrow profile, it was about trust. You could tell when somebody was abusing them. You could see the fear. They under, you know, they were communicating that. So trust and including enjoyment at people that they loved and love and music. Like that's it. And and it's so beautiful, I thought, to just work in that realm. Things weren't confused by language, by speaking and then having misunderstandings and then you've got to backtrack and sort that out and go through reconciliation. I mean, language is beautiful, but then in its essence is just really being with somebody, just really deeply being with somebody. And I just thought that was beautiful. Can you speak a little bit about different theoretical orientations that you were taught? How were you exposed to them and what really resonates with you as a practitioner? Hmm. I think um, my teacher was an original descendant of Clive and Paul, um, Clive Robbins and Paul Nordoff. So she knew both of them and schooled under them. So very much an improvisational model, but it was always really based in evidence-based long before that term came up. It was really about being measurable, accountable, and reliable um, in these observations. Working with people with complex uh, developmental needs allowed me to see how, the ways in which you could be reliable. You could demonstrate reliability of their responses. You could set them up for those successes and you could make small but meaningful gains or better yet going lateral. Like if this is the ceiling, how many different ways can you get eye contact? How many different songs can you present in a genre that they like, that motivates them, that pleases them, that engages them? You know, so evidence base was really important. Improvisation and meeting the moments, definitely. And back then, we really trained more on piano um, than we did on guitar. I remember that being more minor for me and never had classes on voice and drums. So I've made a living singing, but I've really never had voice classes until I did my speech pathology master's and doctorate. Um, and then I got voice, but from a totally different angle. How do you feel like your theoretical sort of orientation foundation has changed over all the years that you've been a clinician? Mm. I think that my observations that were measurable, that were um, observable um, and identifiable has really allowed me to be a keen observer. Um, and because that was a good way for me to learn to be observant, what I'm seeing now in the science is, is telling me why all that happened the way it did. Like, why did people respond better to sung cues than spoken ones? All right, so when the science came out that helped inform that, I did a happy dance. I did it happy because it was like, yes, 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 yes. And so I love that what I had been observing and, you know, uh, documenting through assessments and progress notes was really being revealed for biologically why that's necessary. So then you can take that and uh, um, support why these, why various people should be seen in our field. Um, and deserve to be just like STPTOT, especially in certain areas of our practice. What was your experience with preparing for and taking the CBMT exam? How might it have been different? How do you help prepare people now, students now that are preparing? Okay, that's more relevant. So I've only taken it once. 
and I think it was in 1995. <laughs> um, but I was grandfathered in as a CMT um, when it went into action. Gosh, I'm not even sure what year it was, but let me just say my CBMT number is 17. Yeah. <laughs> For, um, um, in that regard. So how I prepare people now is definitely around understanding the diagnostic categories. So there's kind of a well-known question that that I've used before when um, a paraplegic has just been admitted to um, the unit and you need to to determine what their music preferences are. So would you go to the chart? Would you go to their family? Would you go to their device or would you go to the patient? You know, and then you start to think, well, you know, and if you start to think, then you get a stop because a paraplegic means that his lower limbs do not work. There's nothing to say that he can't communicate that himself. Is It's all in the diagnosis. So if you read something about Parkinson's, you're like, okay, movement disorder, head to, fo- head to toe means facial expression. It means the ability to vocalize. It means the ability to articulate. It means the ability to move, to have trunk control, the tremors and everything. Okay, now what's the question? Mm. So it really is just about being sharp with that and just going through the glossary of a good book that would just give you all of those, make your cards up out of that. And I think the rest of it is really a lot of common sense Um, But I think so much of it rests with the diagnosis or the the language we use. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone describe it like that before. Yeah. But I like that. Yeah. There's specificity in language. There's why I would call somebody an aphasic versus an apraxic. It's, it's very, very specific language. And we, we need to speak that with specificity. And it's always been like a shorthand. If I'm talking in aphasic, I'm not talking in apraxic. You know, okay, now I'm thinking through what what this topic is, what this research is, understanding how it fits into my lived experience. These are the ways that labels don't define us, but they help us to communicate about what is so that we're dealing with. Um, For example, one of the ones that I think is really key is your ACE score, which is Adverse Childhood Experience Score. And if you've not read this book, I highly recommend The Deepest Well to everybody. So it doesn't matter how biologically how you got to your trauma, it's measured in this scale. And Mm -hmm. and that's a communicative piece that for some people, you know, unloading their trauma verbally is is overwhelming. So we can capture that in a score and work accordingly. So our next question is in regards to continuing education. What do you find has been the most helpful for you over the years? Where have you really grown? What would you recommend to individuals that might be seeking out continuing education? Yeah, I would say do it in another field that's complementary to ours. Neuropsychology, neuroscience. I've known people who got their social work degrees. Um, I have a speech language dual certification and boy, oh boy, has that opened doors and come in handy for both sides, Mm -hmm. for both sides. I think that uh, primary to it is, is, is really amplifying your curiosity for knowing really going into why, why. Um, And so my continuing ed has always been um, involved in that. So I do way over what is expected of me in both fields. Um, So speechpathology.com is a hundred dollars a year and I can take as many classes as I want to. And so I do, I indulge like, okay, what's the latest on swallowing? I haven't done swallowing following in a year or so. And then it's like, ah, oh, it's all the same stuff. Okay. You know, but it's good to know what the conversation is out there. Um, and I go to conferences. Um, typically I go to the big music and neuroscience conferences internationally. And I have for a number of years and there are very few music therapists that go there. And I think that um, that's sad for me that there aren't more that are seeing that that's where the answers are coming from. That's where information about how training in music builds a different brain and how that can help with the conditions that we treat Um, or really working with those populations that we do. You know, it's right there, man. And, and 
over the years, I felt like I could see where it was going because it was based on my lived experience in the field. And they need to know these these experiences. They benefit from knowing these stories. Um, and so setting up means of communication with these folks is really, uh, has been great for my continuing education. What has been your experience with advocating for the profession of music therapy within other professions, speech language, or within the medical care system, or anything besides music therapy, basically? Yeah, and that's really where I spend a lot of my time. I do a lot of physician grand rounds. That's a very, very easy conversation to have because it is biologically based. They are totally with me. They are absolutely with me. So at the end of one that I did for palliative care grand rounds, there were, it was a variety of doctors also learning about palliative care. So there were dozens of people in the room and I knew that they were totally with me. And I said to them, how many of you on at this moment know somebody that's on your caseload that would benefit from a music therapy referral? And all hands went up. And so I said to them, um, well, let me let you know that she is only here two days a week for adults and she's here for three days a week. That's a problem that only you can solve. You now need to take the baton and you need to get, and it did, it worked. They got more hours. Before we got to lunch, there were communications. I serve on this nonprofit board. Please submit a grant. I think you can get money from here. I'd be willing to, you know. Yes, you solve those problems. And I think I really love that that moment felt like I could do that because we can't solve those problems. It's got to come from within. And then when I walked into that team, I was hugged by everybody because I was a music therapist and how anxious they were to have a music therapist on the team, how hard that they had worked. And so, oh, day one, you're getting referrals. Think about how different that is when we partner in the advocacy, when we partner in the problem solving. Um, So physicians are the easiest people in the world to talk to, neuroscientists, um, auditory perception labs at MIT, all these places I've been, great. Within the speech language community, which is also my other profession, it has been thorny and it's been really um, sad. It's been gutting. Um, because it's always the patient that loses out. When either side or both sides get territorial, it's always our patients that lose out from the beauty and power of two minds looking at a complex case. The ways that, um, thankfully, since I'm duly certified, I can accomplish both. I know what to do from both professions, but people really deserve that, whether it's in a consultative model or a collaborative, I seek to educate the musicality of speech therapists, and I seek to educate the communication disorders knowledge in music therapists to help bridge that gap, because it has been unfortunately um, unkind and unprofessional, Um, and I ache over that. I've spoken to a number of PTs and OTs over the years. They totally get it. They totally get it. But um, they also, things like movement, gait are so much easier to treat than speech because it's far less complex. It's left, right, left, right, left, right. You know, you cannot do that with speech motor issues. And so anyhow, that complexity really does benefit from having two keen minds. And I think about when a music therapist should be in place and then a speech therapist therapist um, in the sequence of of uh, recovery. So I can say I worked with a set of two-year-old twins who were nonverbal and they were two years of age when I first got them and I did nothing but music. And then one of them started to say, no more songs, Kathleen. And I knew he was ready to just live in the speech world, but they didn't understand that words had meaning because their listening was not wired for speech. And then it and it became that because they were wired more for music. That's one of those studies that I did a happy dance to is understanding that. So they were totally involved in singing. And at three years of age, they were reading independently. One was fully in speech. The other was living in both worlds. But I sent them to a conventional speech therapist for um, that next step. That felt the right thing to do. It was not the work that I really cherished doing. Um, I, I just, but boy, the music, yeah. 
So kind of going forward to more supervision related questions, what do you feel like is really beneficial to you throughout the years in receiving supervision and what's been helpful to you? And then as a supervisor for students and professionals, what is sort of the style that you like to take on? I just had a supervision, a professional supervision yesterday with a new professional. And what I really, uh, what I really cherish is collaboration. Like, how do you want me to be in the world, in your world today? In this new relationship, it was really like, how can I be in your life? Um, and so we worked out what the values that were, and we started to communicate on a um, aphasia choir um, that I had seen films of and what what was done and get her to think about goals. And But I'm really looking to kind of create a picture that she fills in all the details for. Like, here's the landscape. Why were you doing what you, you were doing? Um, what was your biological rationale for those choices? And did you get what you thought you would? And if not, why not? So I just, in a few questions, I asked her to reflect on a session um, and see whether she can find those answers. What is your favorite part about being a supervisor? Um, I think the long-term uh, watching the growth. So um, let me just say that Brandon Hassan, uh, when I first met him the better part of 10 years ago, his musicianship was all over the place. He was is one of the most unbelievable musicians I've ever educated at Berkeley. And is Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is the <laughs> other mother of goodness gracious. Um, but with Brandon, what I saw this time was now that he's in his late 20s, I see this beautiful development of a therapist. I see the wisdom. I see him incorporating the biology. I see him doing the warmth. I see him doing the technology with people online and people in person. I see him validating everybody. Even though there was some that were using communication devices, eye gaze, and there's this delay and there are these other people it it was magnificent to see in the many directions he has evolved. So in my favorite part about having been a teacher is watching my alum soar. There's no mm. doubt about it. And doing everything I can to give them air, you know, to give them wind beneath their wings, so to speak. And I, I was blown away by him this time. So my favorite part is the relationship across time. We're very fortunate to have them here and they both are great for us to continue to learn from and seeing that network of them learning from you and now us all learning from them and learning from each other as well as really a beautiful cycle. It is. Can you speak a little bit about your job searching over the years? What was it like looking for a first job? What advice do you have for a new professional that's looking for a job? What are your non-negotiables and how have you grown over the years in different positions? Ah, those are all really good questions. I never like had a website or used that. That wasn't really used in the time. I, I don't even know how I got some of the jobs that I did at the time, you know, but for a long time, I lived my life quilting a job. I would get I know that a school would write grants and I had several of those. I was doing hospice um, for an agency and I started that program and I was seeing, I was working with a speech therapy practice. So I was getting the, like the twins and I was getting really difficult, difficult speech therapy cases, so to speak, but music made it all lovely. Um, so I think it was really coming through connections. I think advertisements that I answered. And then I started teaching. Um, and even though I didn't educate myself or desire to be a full-time teacher, I've been doing that for 15 years now. And so that was, I mean, it, it was something that I could do and could love doing. And, and for a different reason, I do miss the work. Um, and I'm really pleased now to be seeing some things coming my way. Um, because I need that. I need that to keep it authentic and honest, you know? So still where word of mouth. Where do you feel like the balance is between 
doing clinical work and doing more educational work. Oh, I think it would be lovely if it was two days of each and then one day for reflection and obviously documentation for both jobs. I mean, I probably post 12 to 1400 grades a semester. So it's, there's only so much you want to add into that load. Um, so I, to me, that would be great. Even a day would be marvelous for me. And now that telehealth has become a thing, um, it can certainly make it accessible. Like I would love to serve people with strokes um, and I do a lot with Parkinson's disease and it would be very easy to do over telehealth. It would be beautiful. And it's just what they deserve. So somehow I have to figure out somebody with a fire in their belly to do some really cool music to make their voice better, to make swallowing better, to make their speech more intelligible. As you kind of reflect on your music therapy career as a whole, what stands out to you as some of the most salient parts of your career and kind of looking back, what stands out to you? I think the one thing uh, that stood out to me is that I, my teacher that I met in 1980 is, is a very close friend who I'm going to be calling actually later today um, and set up some time for this summer. And there have been like four or five of us that have journeyed together since 1980. And then it came in, oh gosh, 11 years ago, perhaps, um, that Suzanne Hanser's son died at nearly 28 years of age, just tragic, sudden. And I went to that funeral and I looked down that row of people, Donna Chadwick, Julie Sigo, Karen Wax, these beautiful music therapists who were great leaders in our area, terrific start in Massachusetts Music Therapy Alliance. And I just thought, thank God I have you all to walk through life with. <laughs> thank God there's this strength and beauty in my life. Um, and I think music therapists are really special people. They're people who want to be of service. Um, we're humanitarians with music. Uh, we bring beauty to pain and um, aesthetic moments to death. So music therapists are my favorite people. That would be one of my standouts. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I would love to hear you talk a little bit about self-care, avoiding burnout, how you teach that and how you reflect that to young professionals, your journey with self-care yourself, what really works for you? What do you continue to learn? Yeah, thank you. That's such an important question. And, and I want you to think about how unusual it is that other professions don't talk this way. Because throughout your curriculum, you had self-care projects to do. Am I right? I certainly assign them and involve people in understanding. Once, once you understand how your biology runs, fight or flight or rest and res restoration, you know how to work this better. So I think that that's um, my self-care was enhanced with, especially my desire to understand stress biology better. Um, and self-care is nonstop. I mean, I'm 62, still at it every day in every way. Um, some of the self-care that's important for me right now is to get away from the computer. It doesn't feel right to be on it in the summertime. Um, so gardening has become that. Um, I do um, embroidery. Um, I will tuck into uh, a Netflix show that is eternally optimistic, like Call the Midwife. And I will prepare food lovingly while I'm watching it. Um, of course, making my own music is so key. Exercise is definitely key. I try to start every morning with a real... Um, a uh, chop busting class, you know, spinning or something and just keep the vitality flowing. Um, and then when I start by exercising at the beginning of the day, I can't stress because my body is in rest and restoration. Things don't peak me. They, they don't startle me. Um, and so that's been really key to understanding my, the biology of stress and to working with that. Um, my husband and I are thoroughly enjoying the 10% Happier app and it's guided meditations every day. Can't recommend it enough. And I was, in the beginning, I was like, oh no, no, I teach this stuff. Like I'm not gonna invest, oh, so arrogant. Anyhow, 
there's always something beautiful to be learned. And, and it's so lovely to do it together. And our daughter is backpacking in Europe right now at 19. So we get to sit and do meditation for her and offer us offer her all that we can the blessing of may she be safe may she be well may she be happy so um i have a wide variety of things i get to do at that last a second or that last five minutes or that last 10 minutes or a half an hour and i think it's important for music therapists to think like if you're in between two hospital doors and you just came out of one where it went well or it went south who were you in that space to prepare yourself for the next person. So we have to have short, but deeply meaningful moments that feel like minutes, you know, that that you, you've got this thick neural circuitry for well-being, and you tap into that. Okay, and then for the big question at the end, where do you think our profession is going in the future? Where would you like to see it go? What do you think that we as music therapists can do to help facilitate growth within our profession? Oh, my goodness. So after 40 years, I was just meeting with Dr. DeForia Lane in Cleveland, a well-known, highly accomplished woman who was a generation ahead of me and inspired the daylights out of me, Um, published in Lancet, you know, And we were together in Cleveland last week going, my God, how did we get here? How did we get here? How did we get to AMTA being devolved, decommissioned? I'm not even sure what the right word is it that that is there for it. At a time when NIH, when like the lens of Mordor, the eye of Mordor has creaked, has creaked into our direction. (laughs) <laughs> and we're here. Didn't see this one coming. So we need to have those that are prepared to speak the language of science uh, really engage with NIH. And there have been people doing this beautifully. You know, Wendy McGee comes to mind and uh, comes to mind quickly. And having those people really surround uh, the NIH folks and make sure the messaging is really Uh, right there in the biology, because then we can move move quickly. If they're not still trying to figure out who we are, (laughs) we can start to move quickly. Um, And that's, that's highly doable. So I think the, there's an intense introspection in diversity, inquiry, inclusion practices. And that's just right. But a lot of it has been in the dark side, sort of blaming and shaming um, the profession for being white centric racist. Um, And, you know, it's, it's gone, it's dead now. So now we can turn to the light and how do we want to move forward? Like, how do we want to move forward in those practices? I think that that continuous conversation um, is just dark for me. It's darkness. And, and I also have to say, having been with a couple, three, four generations, I knew Clive Robbins, knew him quite well. Um, that what was what I see, particularly amongst women, um, is that before me, people use their white privilege to dedicate themselves to the profession. So they were the second earners in the family, oftentimes because you couldn't do it. So their choice was that. And I know one senior uh, above me who's really, really bitter because had they devoted all those hours to owning a restaurant or a jewelry store, um, all of the hours that they gave to the profession, they would be sitting in a place of more abundance. Uh, and right now there's, there's scarcity and it's frightening. So people gave of their time so generously, like stupid generously, made a full length movie in 1996 that was satellite broadcast to all teaching hospitals in their spare time, y'all. So I have to say that I look back on those roots and I see devotion, I see loyalty, I see camaraderie, and I want that to go forward. And I want, you know, those were the people that had to do music therapy in boiler rooms. I kid you not, I did. Under stairwells with people going up and down them, I did that. 
you know, the, the <laughs> this was this was um, guerrilla therapy. In many, you know, I remember one time being offered a gig. Oh God, in the eighties, and I'm thinking, oh, that's really a long way away, and that's really a big group of people, and that's really low pay. And it was like, thank you, thank you, I'll take it. Thank you for thinking of me because it was just a job in the profession. So I'd like there to, to, to honor the DNA of hard work, camaraderie. Let's just take the, there's a, it seems like there's a lot of friction within the membership that I would really like to see move away from that to using our life forces, to making other people wrong, other practices wrong, Let's speak a common language to move forward. Um, you know, uh, as I am NMT, I am Nordoff Robbins. I have been trained in both. I have, I'm deeply humanistic and I'm very research oriented. Um, and they all serve the profession beautifully. Um, so that to me is, I just want to go to the light want to get some traction, don't want um, NIH to find nobody's home. Like there's nobody home at AM, a, AMTA. There's nobody to answer the, the phones. So each of us needs to raise up to the highest levels of professionalism to, to speak from the light of the light in love, with love, um, toward a greater goal of coming together um, and honoring the past so that a future can be built and we can have a magnificent tower. We're, we're on an 11 to seven shift. There's a music therapist in a children's hospital for some child who's scared, who's lonely, who's in pain. Like I want those children to be served and the profession has to grow. And I do believe just as I've seen it in other periods of growth, it needs to be more holistic, it needs to be well, and, and, and we need to be kind to one another and move forward. Um, and I think AMTA, frankly, has long had contentious voices and been allowed to do that. Um, and and I, that's probably why, why I stayed tucked into New England and just work from here. I believe those are all of our questions from today. Do you have anything else you would like to add in today that we didn't ask you about that comes to mind? I want you, dear young women, to know that now that you know where I live and how to reach me, that you've got one more place to ask your questions, to really look if there's something you feel I can contribute to you. Please know that I'm a yes and we can figure everything else out. Thank you for agreeing to do this with us, first of all. <laughs> Thank you for rescheduling so I could.